I believe in free will. And I hope that you do as well. The topic before us in these two days is extremely important and we must work hard to understand it. Too often, Calvinists have misunderstood and misrepresented the classical reformed will, uh, view of human freedom to the consternation and confusion of many. Now, I have to tell you what my task is. You know, on Friday when I flew out here from Dallas-Fort Worth, I had one of my favorite seats on an airplane. I was in the front row of coach on the, on the uh, window. And I love that seat because I think the Western United States is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life. So for two and a half hours, I was glued to that window, watching everything from Dallas-Fort Worth all the way to California and everything in between. It's beautiful. Well, that's uh, something of uh, an illustration of what I'm doing today. I'm giving you the 35,000 foot view of free will in the confession of faith. Uh, one way that I put it to my brothers is I said, I'm the tour guide, they're the docents. So I give you the big overview, they get into the details. So I apologize if I don't, if I leave you uh, asking with questions, uh, they'll answer the questions for you. At least they'll do better at answering the questions than I will. So if you don't have a copy of the confession with you, uh, it's in the back of the hymnal that's in the rack before you. I want to survey what the Confession of Faith says about free will. And we'll notice many places that are relevant to the doctrine. Chapter 9 is the real focus of attention for us, but there's a great deal more information that's dispersed in other chapters. And so what we'll be doing is reading the Confession horizontally, or some of you may have heard me refer to this in the past as sideways, noticing the doctrine as it is spread throughout the Confession of Faith. So let's begin with foundational matters from the first section of the Confession. Some of you will know that I call this section First Principles. So look at chapter 1, paragraph 6 and 7 with me. Chapter 1, paragraphs 6 and 7. We read this. I'm not going to read everything in every paragraph, so I might skip down here and there. In fact, I will soon. Paragraph 6. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the word. And then skip down to paragraph 7. All things in scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of scripture or other that not only the learned but the unlearned, in a due use of ordinary means, may attain to a sufficient understanding of them. Now, several matters come to mind on the basis of what I've just read to you. First, everything that we need to know about human freedom is either expressly or implicitly contained in Scripture. Whatever conclusions we draw must be consonant with the Word of God. That's where we begin. Secondly, we acknowledge the necessity of the Holy Spirit to assist us in understanding this doctrine. And with his help, we may come to sound conclusions about our doctrine. And the third thing that I want you to notice from these two paragraphs is this. While the scriptures are perspicuous or clear in matters pertaining to salvation, other doctrines may require greater effort in order to understand them. Not everyone will have a clear grasp on many theological matters. And the topic of free will is certainly one of these. It requires a great deal of thought. It requires us to look at the scriptures and then draw conclusions from the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, we must work hard. We must study closely. 
and we must think clearly if we are to arrive at sound conclusions. Those are some uh, observations that I would make from chapter 1. Now let's move on. In order to think about man's will, we must begin with God. In fact, the first word of chapter 9 is the word God. When we see that as the first word, we are reminded that we have to go back to chapters 2 through 5 and think about theology proper. We can't walk into a study of free will without first reminding ourselves about the truths of God. They are totally relevant. In fact, they're necessary for our understanding. So remember what I said, we're at 35,000 feet, we're at cruising altitude, and we will be cruising. Look at chapter 2 with me. Listen to these words. I'll read about half of the first paragraph and then skip down to the second paragraph. The Lord our God is but one only living and true God, whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, skipping down a little bit, who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, every way infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will. You know, I just love reading those words. The, the thoughts that come to mind as I read them strengthen my heart and my soul. Paragraph 2. God having all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself, is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creature which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. He is the, he is the alone fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things, and hath most sovereign dominion over all creatures to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever himself pleaseth. In his sight, all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature, so as nothing is to him contingent or uncertain. Let's pause right there. Let's stop right there. Now, these realities summarized in chapter 2, paragraphs 1 and 2, are important to keep in our minds. Whatever we may say about man's will must be preceded by our understanding of of God's will. In a very helpful article written by J. Mark Beach, who teaches at Mid-America Reformed Seminary, he's commenting on a, um, a post-Reformation theologian named Gisbertus Vetchus, and on Vetchus's uh, exposition of the Heidelberg Catechism. And in that catechism, Vetchus asks, the, or in, in his exposition, he asks the question, is God's decree different from God's essence, or is it God himself? He goes on, the answer is that it is God himself, for in speaking of God's decree, you are speaking of God decreeing, and the decree of God is the will of God, and the will of God is God willing. Although the decree is one, the things God has decreed are multiple and varied. God's decree comprehends all things. And this is why chapter 3 immediately follows chapter 2. We're talking about the doctrine of divine simplicity here. If you want to hear outstanding material on divine simplicity, go to the conference's website and notice Dr. Dolezal's lectures on divine simplicity from several years ago. Those of you who were here will remember how powerful and helpful they were. But, you see, we must begin with God's will. Because whatever we say about ourselves is dependent upon the nature of the God of heaven and earth, the sovereign and majestic Lord of all things. We think of him first. And so, having read those two paragraphs from chapter 2, we move on to think about the divine decree. Look with me at chapter 3, paragraph 1. God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, all right, there's the Lord's will. He decrees by his most wise and holy counsel, the counsel of his will, 
freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. And we all say, Amen. Yes, we agree. Thank God for that. Yet so as thereby is God neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature. Now we're being introduced to human will. There's no violence that's offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. I know our brothers will be delving into this question about the eternal will of God, the decree of God, and its relationship to human will. What we have here is a fundamental assertion. God's will determines all things, yet in doing so, it does not undermine the reality and freedom of human actions and creaturely responsibility for those actions. Let me say that again. God's will determines all things, yet in doing so, it does not undermine the reality and freedom of human actions and creaturely responsibility for them. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. There are, there are several illustrations of this that make the point so well. Uh, Isaiah 10, 5 through 11 is another. Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger. The Lord sends the Assyrian against the Israelites. And yet Isaiah says, yet he does not intend so in his heart. He goes not as the Lord's instrument, but he goes in order to destroy. He's steamrolling through the Middle East. But that's not the text. Acts 4, 27 and 28. This is when the church is praying after Peter and John have been released from jail. They'd been arrested by the scribes and the Pharisees because they preached about our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the content or a part of the content of the prayer that was made by the church in Jerusalem in response to these events. Notice what they say. Verse 27. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, that is God sent him, made him the Messiah, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, now we're intended by Luke here to think back to the events leading up to the crucifixion, okay? These are the key players. Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose de determined beforehand to be done. They were the instruments and they were guilty of the things that they did. This is the most heinous crime in human history. The, the murder of the pure and holy Son of God by the hands of wicked men. Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel. They chose to do this. Crucify him, they cried out. They sent him back and forth from, from Pilate to Herod to Pilate. It's their fault. It's their action. They did this. And yet... What do they pray? They did the things that your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. All of the events that took place were the result of God's action determining that the Son of God incarnate would suffer at the hands of wicked men and die. But they're responsible for their actions while their actions fulfilled the sovereignty of God. This text demonstrates that God's determined counsel was accomplished in the death of Christ, even while the actions of those who murdered him were sinful. Each participant was responsible for his own words and deeds, as these accomplished the eternal purpose of God in the salvation of the elect. That's what the, the uh, first paragraph of chapter 3 is all about. God decreed from all eternity by his most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever come to pass, yet he's not the author of sin, has no fellowship in it, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature. That is, Herod and Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel acted on their own while they fulfilled the eternal purpose of God. Now there's a delicate balance here, and our brothers will speak of this at greater length. But we do assert 
the sovereignty of God's will in all things, and we acknowledge that the actions of humans are freely chosen by them. And these two things do not contradict one another. All right? Now remember, we're at 35,000 feet. We're just passing over West Texas. We need to get to New Mexico now. Parag uh, chapter 4, paragraph 2 of creation. You know, one of the things I, I wish that I could do is just read through the confession and say, stop, here it is, here it is. We're, we're sort of taking the paragraphs out of context. I hope that you recognize that fact and, and you think through the context in which they're found. Paragraph 2 of chapter 4. After God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, rendering them fit unto that life to God for which they were created, being made after the image of God in knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness, having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it, a, a parallel statement about the will of man, power to fulfill it, and yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, their free will, which was subject to change. What our confession is teaching us here, and this is the language of the Reformed confessions, is that Adam and Eve were created with free will. They were created with the power of contrary choice. They received the law of God with the power to fulfill it. Traditionally, this has been referred to as the ability not to sin, passe non peccare. They were truly free. This is viewing them in the garden prior to their fall. Knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness with God's law internalized placed them in a perfect moral circumstance. That's where they were. That's what we must, we may, and we must say about them. But this ability that was granted to them, a constituent part of their humanity, was not confirmed in them because it was subject to change. They were subject to change. Man was unlike God in that God is immutable, and yet Adam and Eve were made mutable. They were made changeable. Man could fall from his state. And of course, we know the remainder of the story but even though we know the remainder of the story, this ought not to undermine the ominous note that is sounded by these words. Their natural freedom or liberty provided a possibility of transgressing. Now, here we learn that the liberty of the will is a constituent part of man as man. It belongs to humanity. It is an element of his image bearing. Now, while the will was subject to change, it nonetheless is an essential component of the human constitution. And this is one reason why we must carefully uh, think carefully about the doctrine. We as humans did not lose a con constituent facet of our being when Adam fell and brought death upon us. Humanity maintains all of its facilities, in this case, the facility of will. And so every person you meet has a will. This is why I say, I believe in free will. But there's much more that needs to be said, isn't there? Sadly, we know that Adam disobeyed God's command and he brought a curse upon his progeny. Look at chapter 6, paragraph 1. Although God created man upright and, and perfect, and gave him a righteous law which had been unto life had he kept it. Now, let me just pause for a moment. Read the, the language in these paragraphs in terms of ability and will. It, it, it might not use the, the two words, free will, but the, the synonymous language helps us to understand what it's saying about us as humans. I want you to, to think about that as we read this. Let's go again. Although God created man upright and perfect, and gave him a righteous law which had been unto life had he kept it, and threatened death upon the breach thereof, yet he did not long abide in this honor. Satan, using the subtlety of the serpent to seduce Eve, then by her seducing Adam, who without any compulsion did willfully transgress the law of their creation 
and the command given unto them in eating the forbidden fruit, which God was pleased according to his wise and holy counsel to permit, having purposed to order it to his own glory. Now we're back in that sphere of the divine will and the human will. And we're taught that Adam and Eve transgressed without any compulsion, without any external pressure upon them, that Adam willfully, he chose to transgress the law of his creation. He acted upon his free will. And the choice that he made by his free will was to disobey the God who had created him and given him every blessing that one could imagine. He disobeyed the Lord. The Lord said to him, Adam, do you love me? And Adam, by taking the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and eating of it, said, I love something else more than I love you. That's what he did. He chose to do that. This is the dark story of the human will. Without any compulsion, without any external force imposing itself upon him, he did willfully violate the command of his creator. He chose his own pleasure over obedience to the Lord. The Lord permitted this, but Adam acted freely in choosing to do this. Now, the consequence of this act is tragic and it is terrible. Look at the next paragraph. Our first parents, by this sin, fell from their original righteousness and communion with God, and we in them. Whereby death came upon all, all becoming dead in sin, and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. Oh, this is a really important statement to make. It doesn't tell us that man's will was lost, but it does tell us what happens to man's will, that is, man's will becomes part of this statement, dead in sin, wholly defiled. The will is one of the, the faculties or parts of the soul. Our brother will be speaking about faculty psychology later on today. I'm looking forward to listening to that, um, that lecture as he comes and speaks to us. But when we read here about that which is the result of the fall of Adam into sin being dead and wholly defiled, we must acknowledge that that's the truth about the will of man. The Westminster Larger Catechism summarizes this well. This is question 25 and its answer. Wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate wherein two men fell? The answer, the sinfulness of that estate wherein two men fell consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin the lack of that righteousness wherein he was created, and the corruption of his nature, whereby he is utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite unto all that is spiritually good, and wholly inclined to all evil, and that continually, which is commonly called original sin, and from which do proceed all actual transgressions. Let me repeat something I said earlier. Man's will, an essential constituent part of his nature, is not removed from his being. Man continues to be a true human, and all the parts from which he is made remain present. His will remains. It's a free will, but it's now a sinful will. You see, it is wholly defiled in all of its parts, so that all that is chosen freely by the will after the fall is sin. The, the, the will chooses, it's free, but it chooses to do that which is sinful. To use language that we've already seen, freely and without compulsion. As one of the faculties of humanity, man's will is wholly defiled. It remains a truly free will, but it only acts according to its nature so that without external coercion, it freely chooses sin and will always freely choose sin. It will only act according to what it is at all times and in all circumstances. Although a fallen will is always free and acts without external coercion, it can and will only choose to pursue its own lusts and its own desires. It cannot seek God so that it is subject when left to itself to God's wrath and God's curse. This is the dark, deadly reality, and it would leave us 
hopeless without another reality expressed in the final words of paragraph 3 of chapter 6, unless the Lord Jesus sets them free. Oh, I am so thankful for those words in that place. Without them, you'd read that chapter and you would walk away and you'd say, there's no hope at all. Well, the hope is not in me, it's not in my merit, it's not in my actions, it's not in my choice. The hope that I have is in Jesus Christ, it's in the gospel. It's what God does. And so the confession turns there at this point, and it begins to present us with the doctrine of salvation. From chapter 7 through chapter 20, it deals with the, the, the notion of covenant. In chapter 7, paragraph 1, we're taught that God has chosen covenant as the method by which he condescends to humans. But look at paragraph 2. Moreover, man having brought himself under the curse of the law by his fall, it pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace, wherein he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit, notice, to make them willing and able to believe. They still have a will. It's a defiled, wholly defiled will. But the Holy Spirit comes through the word and causes that will to be able to believe the gospel when the gospel comes. The only reason, brothers and sisters, that you and I have life is that God's Holy Spirit came to us at the right time and gave us that life. But it was our wills that believed. He caused our wills to believe the gospel. God in his sovereignty makes a covenant of grace. The object of God's sovereign covenant of grace is sinners, those who were described in chapter 6. It's astounding to consider that we are the objects of this wonderful grace. It's not those who are righteous, but sinners. And what does God require of them? He requires faith. Now at this point, we could go forward in the confession to chapter 14 of saving faith but we won't do that. I want to read you some words similar to this portion of paragraph 2 written by Nehemiah Cox. He said this, All that can be said of men in general unto whom the gospel is preached amounts to no more than this, that the grace and blessings of the new covenant are offered to them upon condition of faith. God declareth his good pleasure to sinners that if they or any of them do confess and forsake their sins, they shall find mercy. And those of them that do believe, he gives the sure mercies of David unto Isaiah 55, 3, and they are under grace, Romans 6, 4. It's only in the new covenant that we find salvation in Christ. The old covenant anticipated. It had promises and prophecies and types and shadows. And the forgiveness of sin was demonstrated to the, through those things, but it would only come through Jesus Christ. Every believer both before and after the great events of the Incarnation, is same, saved in the same way. Prior to Christ's coming, the blessings of the new covenant were anticipated by faith. After he came, we likewise find forgiveness only by faith as we look back to the events of the cross and the empty tomb. Then we come to chapter 9 of free will. But before we look at chapter 9, let me read to you um, some advice from Anthony Burgess, uh, a 17th century English Puritan theologian. He says this, Consider that the grace of God is necessary to guide us in this point, because this question hath always seemed very difficult. Austin, or that's Augustine, he's frequently called Austin, Austin acknowledged it so. Hence he saith that when grace is defended, we are thought to destroy free will, and when a free will is acknowledged, though in some sense only, we are thought to deny free grace. One of the reasons I began by saying I believe in free will, I wanted to catch your attention so that you might say, what is this guy going to say to us today? Let me go on with Burgess. Indeed, the truth is not so difficult, namely, that we have no spiritual liberty to what is good, or that grace only maketh the will free, but how to reconcile this with the natural liberty of the will, that it shall not be as a stock or a stone, that it seemed to some even insoluble, and therefore they advise to captivate our understanding to this point 
as we do the doctrine of the Trinity. However, whether soluble or insoluble, the difficulty argueth the necessity of God's assistance while we preach and you hear about it. Brothers and sisters, let's pray for those who will be speaking to us today and tomorrow that the assistance of the Holy Spirit might come to them and pray for ourselves that the Spirit will enlighten our minds to be able to understand the doctrine of Scripture. Burgess is right. That's a good, helpful statement. All right, chapter 9. This is the crux of the matter. Chapter 9 addresses the matter of free will in a brief, though comprehensive, fashion. The first paragraph is simple and straightforward. God hath endued the will of man with that natural liberty and power of acting upon choice, that it is neither forced nor by any necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. Here we are taught that God has created man's will in a certain way. It possesses natural liberty. That is, by nature, or as created, it has the power of acting upon choice apart from external forces. And that word, uh, the third word in the paragraph is important. God hath endued, or endued, or probably if this were being written today, we might say endowed. It's a technical legal term that means to grant to someone a, a certain blessing, a certain benefit. Um, some, some people will give to a college or a university or maybe to a seminary like IRBS money that becomes an endowment. If any of you have a million dollars you'd like to endow, please come and talk to me afterwards. Brent would like to talk to you as well. We'll take you out to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse to talk about this. <laughs> Endowments. Okay, we still use the term to speak about gifts like that. Well, that's exactly the intention of this word. It's a formal, technical, legal term. God has made the will of man in such a way that it has natural liberty and power of acting upon choice. Now remember, we're cruising at 35,000 feet. Paragraph two. The, the next paragraphs describe the status of the will of man in his various states. That is, as he is made or what happens in his life. So four different states. Um, you may have heard of Thomas Boston's famous book, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. Well, that's what this is about. Paragraph two. Man in his state of innocency had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet was mutable so that he might fall from it. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? It contemplates Adam in the garden. He could do righteous deeds that were acceptable to God. God would account his acts as righteous, but his will was changeable. Paragraph 3. Man, by his fall into a state, second state, into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. We've already said this, let's repeat it. The fall brought terrible consequences, and here again they are detailed for us. Now notice carefully the definition. The fall did not remove the will from man's constitution, but it did destroy his ability to perform any spiritual good accompanying salvation. That's the key point. The second half of the paragraph is explanatory. We have a will. After the fall, we continue to possess a will, though it acts according to our nature, Fallen, sinful humanity has a fallen, sinful will. Keep that in your minds. That's essential. We still have a will, but it's a fallen, sinful will. Man in the state of sin. Paragraph 4. When God converts a sinner and translates him into the state of grace, there's the third state, he frees him from his natural bondage under sin, and by his grace alone enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good, yet so is that by reason of his remaining corruptions, he does not perfectly nor only will that which is good, but does also will that which is evil. By God's actions, sinners are freed from bondage 
so that now our wills, now the freedom from bondage affects all that we are as humans, our wills by grace are renewed and are freely able to do the good, but always by grace. It's grace that is at work in us. Grace causes our wills to choose and to do what is good. But the reality is, because we are still sinners living in a fallen world, we do not only will the good, but we also at times will the evil. Both of those things are present in our lives, and we choose one or the other. Finally, paragraph five. This will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to good alone in the state of glory only. In glory, we immutably shall will only the good. Our wills will be perfected and act according to our perfected nature. They will be free. Now, you know, there's a, there's a, a mirror image relationship between man in the state of sin and man in the state of glory. Man in the state of sin has a free will, but it only acts according to his nature. It will only choose to do that which is good. Man in glory has a free will, and it acts according to his nature, so that he will only choose to do that which is right. You know, one of the objections that sometimes people make to our doctrine is they'll say, well, your doctrine treats man as if he's an automaton, because he cannot choose on his own. My response is, would you say the same about the saints in heaven? Would you say that because they cannot choose to do that which is evil, because their wills have been perfected and they will only choose what is good, would you say that likewise in their situation, they're an automaton as well? I think that that ends the discussion, doesn't it? It, it, it helps. Well, we must press on. My time is running. Par uh, chapter 10. Paragraph 1. Those whom God hath predestinated unto life, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone, and giving unto them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills, and by his almighty power determining them to that which is good, and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. Now, are, are you seeing here this interplay of the divine and the human now that we come to talk about salvation and the grace of God in salvation? What paragraph, uh, chapter 10, paragraph 1 does is it fleshes out for us the teaching of chapter 9, paragraph 4. Man in a state of grace, being transferred from sin to grace. It fleshes out that teaching, providing detail to what has been taught. Effectual calling involves the mind. It involves the heart. Of course, not the organ that pumps blood in us, but using this language as a metaphor, a symbolic granting of life, in the same way that this beating organ in my chest gives me life, so in that sense, spiritually, the heart, that which God gives to me, a, a, a new fleshy heart, provides life. It comes to the mind, the heart, and the will. Our wills are renewed. All of this by God's divine power, so that, notice the end of the paragraph, as the Spirit works in us through the Word, as we are drawn and brought to Him in effectual calling, we come willingly by grace. Willingly we come. Not kicking and screaming, but we come willingly to the glory of God. Chapter 16. Of good works. I hope that you agree with me that there's, there's so much here. It's such a great integration of Christian theology. You know, maybe you expected to hear me talk about chapter 9. I've said very little about chapter 9, but I'm trying to put it into the context of the system of Christian theology. Paragraph, uh, chapter 16, paragraph 3. Speaking of believers, their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves. Now notice the word ability. 
their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but wholly from the Spirit of Christ, and that they may be enabled thereunto, besides the graces they have already received, there is necessary an actual influence of the same Holy Spirit to work in them to will and to do of his good pleasure. Yet are they not hereupon to grow negligent, as if they were not bound to perform any duty, unless upon a special motion of the Spirit, but they ought to be diligent in stirring up the grace of God that is in them. Now this picks up threads about sanctification. And it addresses the cause and effect relation between the work of the Spirit in a believer and the believer's works. The, spirit acts, the Spirit's acts have priority as the cause, and they result in the acts of the believer, the effect. So that the new and renewed ability is holy from the Spirit, but still it is what you or I do. Um, this is the second time, by the way, in the confession that it has incorporated the language of Philippians 2, 12 and 13. You'll remember that. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you, both to will and to do. Paul tells the Philippians that they are to do this work, and yet it's God who is working in them. It, it's like uh, the last of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Do you ever pause to think about that? The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Who does it? The answer is yes. <laughs> the Spirit doesn't control yourself, but when you control yourself, you do it by the Spirit who works in you. See that cooperating action? That's, that's the will, that the Spirit comes to us as believers and calls us to do this. Uh, here we find Philippians 2, 12, and 13. It's also in chapter 9, Paragraph 4 becomes an important part of the theology of the change that takes place in us. Chapter 17, paragraph 2. I apologize that this is so rapid. We are approaching the Colorado River heading for our landing in Southern California. 17.2. This perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immutability of the decree of election flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father, upon the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ and union with him, the oath of God, the abiding of his spirit, the seed of God within them, and the nature of the covenant of grace, from all which ariseth also the certainty and infallibility thereof. What we're taught here is that believers do not persevere by free will. That is, we don't keep ourselves in the faith by our own grit and determination. I won't fall away from the faith. I will do this. No, that's not how it works. The Scottish 17th century Presbyterian James Durham said this. If believing depended on free will, then our perseverance depends on it also. For if the man's free will change... Okay, now he's talking about what happens. If the man's free will change, he may fall and break his neck in a manner. So he's, he's using the, the physical to illustrate the spiritual. What happens when a person falls and breaks their neck? Typically they die. That's the point that he's saying. If we're left for our own fr free will, he says, he may fall and break his neck in a manner at the very threshold of heaven. Just as we're about to go into the presence of God, we may fail if we're kept by our own free will. He says, whereas if it be the work of grace, as indeed it is, that brings forth faith and carries it on, and if this work of grace cannot be frustrated or restrained by the malice and hardness of heart to which it is applied, because it cures the hardness and removes the malice, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Though our natures change by regeneration, Still, grace carries us through. And only in heaven will our wills be confirmed in righteousness. We need election from God's love. We need the intercession of Christ. And we need the covenant of grace in order to persevere. So we're not left to our own free will to make it to heaven. Chapter 19. Chapter 19, paragraph 7. In this chapter that deals with the law of God. 
Neither are the aforementioned uses of the law, how the law is to be applied in our lives, contrary to the grace of the gospel, but to sweetly comply with it, the spirit of Christ subduing and enabling the will of man to do that freely and cheerfully, which the will of God revealed in the law requireth to be done. Once again, it's that co-action of the divine and the human. The will of God revealed to us in the law. It tells us what God expects from us. The spirit of Christ comes and enables our will to freely and cheerfully obey God's law. And this complements what we've already seen about good works. The spirit works in believers to give ability to freely and cheerfully obey the law. We obey by our free will, enabled by the Spirit. Once again, it's Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation, for it's God who works in you, both to will and to do. Well, my time is just about gone. Uh, I would turn you to chapter 21, paragraph 1, which speaks about Christian liberty. You'll notice uh, it uses language of bondage to Satan and the dominion of sin, that we are delivered from this. Notice the last part of the first paragraph of paragraph one, if that makes sense to you. The, the Spirit of God gives us free access to God. We yield obedience, as we've just seen, not out of slavish fear, but a childlike love and a willing mind. So he makes us willing, and we have the freedom to follow him. The freedom of believers has been purchased by Christ. It delivers us from many things, including the bondage to Satan, the dominion of sin, and it sets us free for many things. We serve God from a willing mind. And once again, grace enables so that we freely draw near to God, freely. We have access to him, and we obey and we love him willingly. We do these things by grace. One more place that I intended to turn you to is in chapter 26 of the church. Paragraph 6 of chapter 26 speaks about the members of gospel churches. They demonstrate by the way that they live their lives, obedience to the call of Christ. In the middle of the paragraph, it says they willingly consent to walk together according to the appointment of Christ because they give themselves up to the Lord and to one another by the will of God in professed subjection or obedience to the ordinances of of the gospel. Here's another result of grace. Now it's not so much individual as it is collective. It's, it's contemplating the body of Christ, the church, which consists of many members, all of them with renewed wills, who agree together to work to the good work out of obedience to Christ. That's what a church is. It's a body of renewed believers whose wills have been made new in whom the Spirit of God is at work, who work together for the glory of God. Let me give you very briefly a conclusion. I hope you'll agree with me that our confession of faith actually has quite a lot to say about the will of man. There's a lot here. As image bearers, we may act just like God. His will is decreed, ours is freely chosen. The will is a constituent part of our humanity. It's not lost in the fall, but it acts according to our nature, and after the fall, our nature is sinful. For Adam, the will could do that which is pleasing to God. Since the fall, though it's still free, it chooses without coercion only to do sin. But when it's renewed by the Spirit's grace, it may do good or it may choose to sin. But it's grace that supports and acts, and believers who choose an act. And finally, in glory, our will will act according to its nature and only choose what is good. And I say, Lord, bring that day soon. Amen. Thank you.